today's world, there are a lot of people talking about being successful. You can hardly turn on the TV or pass by a newsstand and see a magazine cover that's not talking about someone's success. In fact, if you go to Barnes and Noble or, well, not Borders anymore, but Books a Million, they have a whole section of books written to tell you how to succeed. And there are a lot of people out there buying them, obviously, or they wouldn't have a section devoted to that. There are a lot of people out there that are looking for that newest and latest and greatest book. It's going to teach them how to make their life full of meaning and purpose. It's going to solve all their problems. It's going to be the answer that they've been searching for, the Holy Grail. The ironic thing to me is that so many of the books are written by people whose only success is writing a book. <laughs> they have no real experience in the world. All they've done is written that book. Someone is trying to tell us how to be successful. If I want to know how they've been successful, I'll get a publishing software and put it on my computer. But when I want to learn about success, real honest success, I want to find someone who's done it. I want to find someone who has accomplished what I'm trying to accomplish. I want someone who can lead by example, not just by telling me what to do. We learn a lot more about success from examples and models than we do from manuals. In Philippians, Paul writes about succeeding in life. In chapter 3, he gives us a model for successful living, and he encourages us to follow this example. I'd like you to listen this morning to what he writes as I read this morning I'm actually reading from the message because I love the way Peterson paraphrases this passage. It's from Philippians 3, verses 4 through 14. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it even though we can list what many think are impressive credentials. This is Paul speaking. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church. A meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. But the very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing away in the trash, along with everything else that I used to take credit for. Why? Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by Him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I can get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ. I gave all that up, all that inferior stuff I gave up so that I could know Christ personally, experience His resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering and go all the way to death itself. 
If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I had this all together, that I had it made, but I am well on my way because I'm reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I consider myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal. The goal where God is beckoning us onward. Onward to Jesus. And his closing words are, I'm off and running, and I'm not turning. In that passage, Paul shows us how to be a successful follower of Jesus Christ. Not by just what he's writing, but by the life that he leads. Paul doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. In the verses that I just read, we can see his example and the pattern that his life had. And the four, in that passage, I think there are four keys to successful living as a Christian. The first one, doesn't come easily to many of us, is to face and admit our shortcomings and our weaknesses. We all want to think we've got it together. But none of us here is perfect. No one of us has it all together. I don't care how good of a front people put on. They don't have it all together. It's important to remember this because we all, every single one of us, no matter where we are, have a long way to go. Yes. Before we can even think about success, we have to take stock of where we are right now. And the beginning of that taking stock is to say, these are my weaknesses. It's all right here in front of you. We've got to know where we are before we know where we want to go. We have to look for areas in our life that need improvement. Paul tells us in his letter that even at his age, now he wrote Philippians a couple of years before or after he wrote Philemon. And we know it when he wrote Philemon, he was probably around 62 to 65 years old. So Paul's an old man at this point. He admits in this letter that he is not an expert, that he's not perfect, that he doesn't have it all together. But he does tell us that many people forget that he has a goal. That he has had a goal since he was struck down on the road to Damascus. And he has followed that goal. Not perfectly, not completely, he hasn't seen the end yet, but he saw the goal. And he has followed it in all of his ministry. The thing that's so amazing about Paul's statement is that when he writes this, he is an old man sitting in prison in Rome. I mean, he's not just out on the town or out planting churches now. He, he's done ministry. At the point he's writing this, he is sitting in prison, in chains, in Rome, facing a sure execution. If anybody can claim that he had it all together, I think probably it's Paul. You know, he wrote most of the New Testament. He was probably the most influential player in spreading Christianity to Asia Minor, planted more churches than anyone else. Yet Paul, at the end of his life, is saying, I don't have it all together. I have a very impressive pedigree on paper, but I tore it all up and threw it away. Because that's not important. 